Great. While everyone's coming in, I think I might just um, get started with a little bit of a welcome to everyone. Thank you all for being here um, for the Sensi Lab Forum. Um, for those of you who are new to the forums, um, these are showcases uh, that we hold at Sensi Lab who um, engage with the work of leading creators who are working at the intersection of art, uh, creative tech, and research. And um, today we are absolutely honored and really excited to have with us um, Lim Kok Yong from Malaysia. Um, Kok Yong is an artist working with new media and digital technology, and he is a senior lecturer in media arts at the Multimedia University of Malaysia. Um, his work investigates the mind. Uh, media environments and material processes and draws on his interest in the existentialist perception of the human condition. Um, he's a deep thinker and he asks big questions and he's here to talk to us today about things like the meaning of existence, how we come to doubt it and how media tech can offer us new modes of perception of our existence. So thank you, Kok Jung, uh, for being so generous with your time and for speaking with us today. Um, Thank you also to the audience for, for being here. And um, for those of you who haven't joined our forums before, uh, please leave your questions for Kuk Yong in the Q&A tab or in the chat window. Um, he's going to do a presentation and then he will be able to come back to your questions at the end for a Q&A, which, uh, which we will do the best we can with under these kind of, um, you know, virtual circumstances. So. I'm going to disappear and hand over to Kuk Jung. Thank you so much for, um, for joining us. And I'm really, really excited to hear about your work and your presentation. Thanks. OK, uh, good afternoon. And uh, thank you for coming to this uh, webinar. Uh, thank you, So Jung and uh, Katie, for initiating this and inviting me as a speaker for the Sensi Lab uh, uh, webinar, which I find it uh, to be a very interesting program. I hope everyone is uh, staying positive and coping well with the uh, COVID pandemic and also the uh, the lockdown. Um, the topic of my webinar today is uh, being here and there. I did a little bit of uh, typography play with the title over there. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit more about existential media in post-virtual geophilia. I'll explain what those terms mean later on. Uh, firstly, I'm going to talk about the philosophical uh, underpinning of my research and also my creative projects, uh, mainly revolving around the metaphysical ideas of uh, existence. Uh, what does it mean by existence? I think there's no more interesting time than this to talk about human existence. Yeah, how do we come to the realizations of our existence and how do we come to the top of it? Uh, how do we come to the consciousness of our selfhood? Uh, as we know, our contemporary life is uh, divided uh, very much between the physical and virtual world. How can uh, media technology uh, offer us new modes of uh, perceptions of our existence? Um, secondly, I'll, walk, I'll move on to talk about some aspects, philosophical aspects of the uh, media technology that I uh, mostly use in my projects. And uh, I'll talk about the aesthetic possibilities offered by this media technology as well. And I would also like to put forward some ideas about existential media, which is my propositions extending from uh, Steve Mann's concept of uh, existential technology, with which we build a symbiotic relationship with to bring forth the essential meaning of uh, life. What I would like to do is also to introduce uh, the concept of post-virtual, uh, which was put forth by put forward by my professor, uh, Professor Yoon from Songsiu University in Korea. He called this the second phase of uh, media art, uh, particularly related to projects or artifacts whose existence uh, is in physical domain, but their uh, origins are actually bit from uh, the virtual domain. Uh, the closest example that we can see uh, for any post virtual objects are Internet of Things, um, smart objects, uh, which involve or comprises of some uh, physical substance such as uh, water, uh, stand, sand, 
Uh, these are the materials that we find in physical world, but in post-virtual, they are modulated by data. Yeah, uh, and of course, last but not least, uh, locative media, um, which were used in uh, one of my recent projects, and also digital fabrication as well, which uh, epitomize the post-virtual uh, characteristics. Lastly, I would introduce some of the projects that I've selected and that I've done in the past. Uh, while I introduce, I also talk about the role of technologies um, in helping uh, the faculty with which human uh, can use to perceive uh, our own existence um, to gain a reflexive sense of uh, being. Is everyone else, if everyone's okay, I'm just going to turn off the uh, camera uh, so that you can focus on the screen and the slides and also to reduce the, the load of the uh, streaming. Thanks, Katie. Okay, uh, for a start on the background, I'll begin with uh, existentialism, uh, which is a set, which is a philosophical movement that emphasizes on individual existence, freedom, and choice. And this uh, development of a man's consciousness of himself is said to begin with uh, Descartes. Uh, he's the one who first established man positions as a being who can not only think but also think about his own thinking. With this saying, Descartes is focusing on the uh, mental process or the cognition, cognitive process of thinking about one's uh, existence. And this philosophical thinking begins with uh, human subjects. If I want to relate this to a more Eastern uh, philosophy, uh, I can think of the examples of uh, soul or spirit. Um, also in the West, populated in the 16th century alchemy and 19th century science fictions, there was uh, speculations of uh, homunculus, uh, which is a representation of a small human being uh, living in our brain and doing all the master control uh, in our brain. Yeah, um, a popular um, in a popular associations with the concept of soul and the spirit is also. Uh, related to the concept of a uh, third eye in Hinduism or the Archana Chakra. I believe all human concepts known to us as some kind of concept of mind, spirit or soul as distinct from a uh, physical body. A rather modern interpretation would be the scientific basis for the existence of a human soul, which leads to the discovery of an inner brain structure with the size of a pine, uh, pine nut. So this uh, pine nut size uh, uh, substance is called the pineal gland. Uh, which leads the philosopher to believe that it has a metaphysical quality. So these are, this, these are the metaphysical foundations of uh, selfhood, which uh, very much form the basis of most of my research and projects. Yeah? Mostly it's about the quality that institutes one's individuality, as in how I know who I am, what I am, uh, how I exist here, um, why, and so on and so forth. So Cartesian's uh, uh, cognitive model laid the foundations for the dualism, uh, which is the mind-body complexity, uh, which sparked off into many discourses on the relationship between um, the mind and the body, uh, or another way of saying the cognitions and actions. The, the, the weakness in Descartes' argument is that the notion of a master area of the brain that will be capable of understanding what is being perceived um, to Zaki, a scholar, is a logical and neurological problem in as much as there would still be the question of who is actually looking at the image from the Cartesian theater or uh, from the master area. That's why in the concept of uh, artificial intelligence, uh, this uh, philosophical concept does not hold up well. Uh, as we see, uh, a lot of computer scientists who started off with a top-down approach uh, by building a supercomputer as a mastermind of that control all the subordinate, subordinating activities has, has, has failed. Yeah. 
So now let's take a look at the argument put forward by Heidegger. His main contention is that uh, an individual is not only the thinking subject, but also the acting, feeling, a uh, living human individual interacting with the surrounding phenomenon. This point of view is more appealing because it must be remembered that if there's a consciousness, uh, there must be defined in relation to something else. Meaning to say, uh, the consciousness is always of something. Yeah, so there must be a perception that leads and contributed to the emergence of consciousness. So that set apart the different the difference between a being by thinking and being by doing. If artificial intelligence can learn to perceive, uh, ultimately artificial intelligence could also have consciousness. That's why recently we see the development in computer science. They are changing to a bottoms up approach uh, where the computer scientist is taking a reductionist approach by looking into a, a, a smaller uh, um, a perceptive technology, for instance, uh, computer visions, facial recognition, speech recognitions, and eventually uh, all this uh, perceptive technology could actually contribute to the emergence of uh, consciousness, if we like to call it. So, echoing Sami Zaki, who is a scholar studying the neural correlates of affective state, such as the experience of love, desire, and beauty, um, mostly related to the biochemical responses that are generated by sensory inputs within the field of uh, neuroscience. Zeki polarity of uh, perceived phenomenon claim that eventually consciousness will be an emergent property. Yeah, I would like to relate this to how our brain assembles spatial information from a wide variety of uh, sensory perceptions uh, to tell us or to create a sense of where we are later on. Having a look at the dichotomy of being by thinking and being by doing, uh, purported by the existentialists and also the phenomenologists. Now let's, now, let's now think about the nature of uh, a reality. Yeah. So if we're following these two of Scott's, basically uh, the, there are two types of reality yeah, which lie beyond our conscious experience. One is the being of the object of consciousness, uh, which is on the platonic uh, scale. And this is a reality in a mental state. Uh, the other one would be the consciousness of the environment, which is the physical reality. Yeah, so those advocates of uh, Descartes will argue that the object of consciousness exists in itself. It doesn't need the environment. Uh, but this model is independent and non-relational. Those advocates of Heidegger would argue that reality is a realm um, or a phenomenon we, with which we act upon together. Essentially, I think it's fair to think of uh, consciousness as the nature of our reality. Um, simply put, they are the difference between our subjective reality versus a world of subjective, uh, objective consciousness or objective reality. So the debates between these uh, two were rage on for a while and take on a rather different trajectory. So we see a lot of argument on mind versus body, right? Uh, intellectualism or the platonic versus uh, empirism. Uh, the most popular discussions would be the embodiment and disembodiment in the media studies. Uh, immanence versus uh, transcendence. Uh, cognitions versus perceptions. Metaphysics versus physics. These are the conversations or the discourses that open up my mind to the interconnected world of uh, philosophy, psychology, uh, neuroscience, and uh, a little bit of uh, artificial intelligence. Uh, 
uh, as we know, technology is offering us a new mode of perceptions of our presence, um, especially when the reality is further complicated by the virtual um, counterpart, creating a separations between um, the physical reality and also the virtual reality. Uh, in my own words, a separations between here and there. Uh, this phenomenon presents uh, us, or at least me, with an opportunity to rethink the mind-body problems. Thus, I see a resurgence of a new existential attitude in 21st century. And for me, I think that the whole cyberspace, it's rather a metaphysical laboratory, which allows uh, people from different uh, domain or disciplines to take uh, to take on the different approaches to mind, body, and phenomenon, and do some crazy experiment about it. Um, of particular, I would like to quote uh, Catherine Hayes. Uh, she brought technological language into these uh, metaphysical discourses. Yeah. So basically, Hayes has argued for an embodied mind and action in a system of brain, body, and other aspects of the world in the sense that mind, body, and earth are integrated as one. Yeah. So this is a post-humanistic view of a virtuality. Um, basically, Catherine Hayes is standing in opposition to immateriality and disembodiment uh, purported by the early cyberneticists. Uh, she further moves beyond the traditional Cartesian dualism uh, between uh, mind and body, and she she did not only argue for the importance of uh, embodiment, but she advocated the blending or the entanglement of embodiment this and disembodiment that very much foregrounded the definitions of uh, virtuality. Yeah. So the following words of Hayes are worth uh, quoting in these connections. Uh, she says, virtuality is the cultural perceptions that material objects are interpenetrated by information pattern. Yeah, putting this in our living context, we are very much switching between, you know, offline and also online uh, on daily basis. So in that sense, uh, we are all post-human. Uh, other scholars who are in favor of post-humanistic views will argue for the same as well. For instance, uh, uh, Sherry Tucker, yeah, who say that we are all alone together. Andy Clark, who put forward the idea of the extensions of mind. Um, uh, connecting this to wayfinding, we are using a sensory cues from uh, GPS technology and satellite um, to explore the world. Yeah. I, I, I think that uh, Catherine Hayes' account of post-humanism provides a rather more holistic approach towards the uh, information and metal duality. Yeah, so a post-human can be said to be doubly encoded, uh, defined by Hayes as assisting both as a physical object and also an instance of information flow. So... Uh, Catherine Hayes' proposition presents us an opportunity to think, to rethink the mind-body problems and the legacy of the earlier existentialist and also the phenomenologist approach to the mind, body, and phenomenon. Now, I would like to move on to talk about uh, uh, um, the project that I've done in the past. Uh, the one that I would particularly like to highlight, uh, which is the one that you are seeing on the screen right now. Uh, the title for the piece is called When You Are Not Your Body. Uh, this is the first installations that I made for uh, my solo exhibitions, uh, which is my only solo exhibitions. Yeah. Um, for this, I call this, uh, uh, I give this an acronym, W-Y-A-N-Y-B. Um, which is taken from the the first letter of the of the title, yeah. So I call this a little metaphysical adventure, 
explaining and challenging the nature of being and the world. Um, let me explain a little bit how the installations work. Um, basically, the installations is separated into two rooms. Um, as the audience enter the room through a passage um, that leads to the, the bigger room, um, they will come, they will encounter a mirror and the hidden camera behind the mirrors will actually capture their profile image without them knowing. As they enter the room, the bigger room, they'll see a coffin line like kind of a, a, a sculpture, which, uh, which is inviting them to open up the, the cover. Yeah. As they open the cover, they will see their portrait, their face superimposed with uh, a selections of uh, virtual body, uh, which they have the freedom to choose from. So they can switch uh, and pick the body that they like. So in this particular project, I would like to uh, offer the visitor an experience of out of body so that they can have the experience of psychological empathy with their virtual bodies. And this, I hope, will provide them an important perspective about being in the material world as well as being in the immaterial world. Uh, on, the, on the wall, uh, in the bigger room, uh, the audience will come across uh, a projections of a montage. Yeah, a montage of everybody's uh, profile picture. Uh, I would like to point to the fact that this was done in 2009 uh, in, a relative, in a relatively early stage of cybernetic development in uh, Malaysia. But at that time, we slowly see a lifestyle um, to migrate into a, a, a more disembodied kind of a lifestyle. That was the beginning of uh, Facebook and so are other social media. I would like the uh, audience to be able to see that they no longer have to be contained or imprisoned in the containment of their body, but they can reach out to, to there, to the other world, uh, which is the virtual world, right? Um, and I would also like to, them to think about by using the metaphor of the coffin um, what does their mortal body mean to them? Uh, what do they leave behind uh, when they die? Right? Uh, is this a mortal body, a corporeal framework, or a massive body of information, or uh, just a memory? Um, at the end of the day, uh, there's a very funny and playful twist in these installations as the visitor uh, come to the understanding of the mechanism, they start to be playful, uh, be very playful in the installation. They'll go back to the passage uh, where the mirror is situated and they start to capture, you know, and by uh, capturing their portrait with a very funny pose. Yeah, so at the end of the day, it becomes a very interactive uh, and enjoyable installations instead of a very serious, uh, philosophically informed uh, 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 interactive installations. So having a look at this work, work uh, let's now think about the idea of uh, body ownership. Yeah, body ownership is a fundamental aspect of presence and self-awareness the feeling that your body belongs to you and is constantly there, yeah? So you feel the pain and that sort of uh, uh, reinforce your sense of being in this uh, physical reality. But think about other psychological states like dream, hallucinations, uh, daydreamings. We actually do have the capacity of transcending our body, uh, especially in some of the, you know, uh, a tribal, uh, practice where, you know, they can literally transcend their body and get out of the body and enter into a, a, 
uh, an imaginative realm. Yeah, think about in technological context as well, such as telerobotics uh, that allow us to externalize the self to include uh, remote tools that uh, ultimately that we take them as part of our own body. Think about 4D motion picture as well. Why do we sweat? Um, have you forgotten that we are actually safely seated in a theater? Yeah. So according to uh, a scholar named Daniel Dennett, he called it an illusionary shift in point of view. So I'm looking at the possible varieties of the ways uh, through all this uh, creative endeavor and artistic endeavor uh, that human body can actually be seen to be appearing and disappearing in a relationship with a hyperlink global world or global data sphere. So in this particular installation itself, you can see that there are so many levels of presence, absence, visibility, invisibility, embodiment, and disembodiment. It ultimately deal in the questions about what we become and how we are assembled in and through digital technology. This all together add up to the questions about the ontology of what we are now as part of the as part of the cyber world. Now I'd like to present to you the concept of uh, network self. Uh, in cyberspace, yeah, in social media particularly, uh, the network portraits are formed by us. Yeah, the network conditions is based on two fundamental elements, growing wealth of data being provided and multitude of user contributed this data. So I'll give you an example. Uh, Facebook, for example, yeah, it mainly, uh, it does not operate on a physical space, but it work on a platonic space, a mental space, yeah, a conceptual space. Uh, if you are only al alone, right, by yourself in the Facebook, yeah, you probably would not take the platform seriously. But uh, as you have more and more friends and families in your network, and you start to socialize and interact and also communicate uh, with the other parties, and you are aware of the existence of the other parties, you start to take that platform seriously right and you think of that platform as a livable uh, platform parallel to our physical one yeah um Network portraits and data bodies are basically uh, two sides of the same coin. Yeah, one is about the image of the self, and the other one is about the uh, the data that we leave behind uh, of our presence. So yeah, while we are physically, while we are virtually navigating in the uh, the virtual world, we leave behind uh, traces of a lot of uh, intangible remains. Yeah, I would like to refer to the other project of mine, which was done in 2013. Uh, it's a project called Super Corridor. Yeah, it's uh, Super Corridor is an ambient projections along a corridor to promote the moments of reflections using time and presence as uh, key parameters. So I'm using the analogy of a walking uh on a sandy beach yeah so say you're walking along a beach imagine yourself walking along a beach you actually leave behind a lot of uh, uh, uh your footprints as the next wave uh that wash up you erase your history that's exactly how it works in super corridor but in a digital manifestation yeah, so by using the analogy of footprints on the seashore, Super Corridor performs a mapping of the passage in time. Yeah, um, th as, the, as the, the user walk along the corridor, uh, they'll see the digital uh, mark that they leave behind. And every 15 minutes or so, the, um, 
the, 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 the software itself is programmed to delete and wash away the memory. And then it will become a fresh uh, blank screen with white projections and white noises. Yeah. Uh, also, at the end of the day, it become very much uh, a, a fun installation because it was installed in a school setting. So the school children knows how it works and they start to go come back again and again by bringing different objects, objects of colors, uh, umbrellas, big objects, or they work together with friends to create different pattern. Uh, um, have you say that the pattern is being arrayed is uh, every uh, 15 minutes but at the back back end I'm actually recording all right the data uh, Uh, the bodies uh, over time so you you see activities uh, the pattern of the activities at the different point of time next so uh, and it's still live uh, you can visit www.opscasavan.com and you come across uh, a collections of a visual diary of uh, a collective past related to our community in relation to a very uh, a unique food in this region. It started off as a very small, humble documentation of oral history of my grandmother eating uh, cassava plant. Yeah, To give you a little bit of historical context uh, of this plant, uh, during the Japanese occupations in Malaysia, back then it was called Malaya, a lot of uh, the people in their generations resorted to eating the cassava roots that they find in the backyard of their home yeah, due to the food ration or due to the uh, scarcity of food. Cassava is a, a, a rooty potato kind of um, vegetables, very high in uh, carbohydrate. Yeah? So it's very easy to fill up your stomach, uh, but it has very little nutritious. Yeah, and it thrives in tropica and also subtropica regions with a lot of sunlight and uh, uh, with and also a lot of uh, rainwater as well. It become a stable food for many countries uh, such as Brazil, um, uh, Africa, uh, Indonesia, and also uh, Philippines because it thrives in a very harsh uh, conditions. So I'm looking at the uh, um, a social and cultural significance of the cassava plant uh, and I start to open up the system to become a, a wiki project, a sort of participatory uh, museum that allows people to contribute stories and memories related to the plant. Yeah? So I'm drawing a parallel between the migratory process of the plant because it's not a native plant, it actually comes from uh, Southern America. Yeah, so I'm drawing parallel between the diasporas and also the dispersal of the meaning yeah, over the course of its travel in the history. Yeah, and it's comparable to my own history as well as uh, 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 third generation of immigrants, a Chinese immigrant in Malaysia. So this is sort of like an analog analogy of my autobiography. Uh, I also take it as a metaphorical quest to trace my historical lineage. This is where uh, Operasi Kasava started uh, with version 1.0. Uh, it's just a very experimental project where we put up some fancy artificial UV light, some uh, goodie bags with uh, soils for the plants to grow, and we hook up different types of sensors just to monitor the living conditions of the plant uh, indoor 
and also to trigger uh, projections of text and images um, in the gallery. Um, in year 2013, uh, I was invited to uh, YCAM, which is the Yamaguchi Media Center in Japan, uh, for a program called Open Core Laboratory and Explorations into Social Anthropology. Anthropology. Yeah, so I designed a food laboratory called Opera C. Casava 2.0. And in this project, in this extended version, I got the opportunity to work with uh, ethnographer, uh, crop scientist, uh, botanist, uh, and also computer scientist to develop uh, a monitoring systems and also uh, urban farming systems. Yeah, so this is the main hall of uh, YCAM. Uh, I turned it uh, into an indoor uh, cassava farm. Uh, visitors uh, are free to come in and check out the plants, uh, which are monitored by our monitoring system as well. And there's a live streaming of our database and also uh, stations for people to contribute a new content to the database. Uh, basically, I was expecting some uh, different narratives coming from the country, uh, the Japan, Japan, uh, who colonized um, Malaya, uh, Malaysia, uh, and I wanted to see what do they have to say about this uh, part of the history. Uh, it becomes a very interesting uh, community project. Uh, we see active participations from the local community, especially the housewife. They came in and uh, they play around, experimented with the cassava um the cassava root and they prepare different recipe every day and we even set up a local community radio stations for them to share their experience uh be it directly related to cassava or not so we also see children actively participating in this uh, food laboratory in opera C cassava 3.0 uh, it's another extension of uh, Opera C Cassava projects. Uh, in these versions, I actually bring the Cassava archives on stage and turn it into an audio visual performance. So it's a very much a multi sensory experience because I was literally cooking uh, cassava in the gallery. So I put up a repertoire of cooking the cassava. Uh, following a recipe that I inherited from my uh, grandmother uh, before she passed away. Yeah, so all the uh, cooking equipments are hooked up or connected to uh, digital equipments and every touch of the equipment is sort of trigger a sound component. So by the time I finish the cooking, I'm also done with uh, a, a musical compositions with uh, live projections of the visual coming from the database. Yeah, I'll just play you a, a three minutes video. So those uh, tiny texts that you saw just now on the screen was coming from the online Kasava Museum. And these are some of the uh, uh, images and writing contributed by the participants of the uh, online Kasava Museum.
Okay, so basically it just built up uh, from here. I'll go back to the slides. Yeah, this is the last version, uh, the latest version of Opera C Casalva called Opera C Casalva 4.0, uh, memory farming. Uh, at this version, I sort of designed the system as a whole autopoietic or self-regulated system. I like to call it a cybernetic system or cybernetic organism. Yeah. So you see on the wall, that is the projections of the content uh, mining from the database. Uh, from opscassava.com and is hooked up to the live and fresh cassava roots. As the cassava roots is dying off, uh, it also trigger the tags to fall off, uh, to, to fade off. Yeah, so it's sort of suggesting the concept of uh, remembering and also forgetting. In the glass uh, container, there's actually a live cassava, young cassava plant um, that's also connected connected to uh, 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 cybernetic systems, yeah? Uh, it's open for uh, new contributions of uh, memory. Uh, as people tweet and uh, submit content to the database, it will trigger the UV lights and also the watering system, sort of sustaining the life of a new uh, cassava, yeah? So it's a system that, um, that allowed human interacting with a cybernetic uh, platform as well as plants. Yeah, even though it's in the form of an aesthetic object, uh, I would like to interpret Opscasava 4.0 as an embodiment of human with the memory of a particular community. And this project is built on the premise that plants can actually be autopoietic and it can be an agency for human being. And same as human, they are self-referential, have a history and they react selectively to their phenomenon surroundings. Yeah, this, uh, you know, by diverting my attention to plant is sort of also allow me to get away momentarily from a very anthropocentric or human-centric uh, view of uh, consciousness. My next point is in regards to the separations between uh, here and there, yeah. Um, I would like to relate all the concepts that I have discussed that I have discussed before uh, in relation to existentialism and uh, phenomenology uh, to how we assemble spatial information from wide variety of uh, sources, creating a sense of um, um, where we are, and this can be summed up as the relationship between the two sides. Yeah, in my words. Uh, the differentiations between the sense of being here and there. Here, I'm presenting a summary of my observations of different kind of presence we experience with um, technology now. Uh, on top of the list is being here, which is our default presence in the physical world, uh, followed by being there, a remote presence mediated by uh, simulated presence technology. Uh, from being here, to being from being there to being here, which is my concept of uh, Jophilia, extending from my professor's uh, concept of post virtual. Basically, what it means is um, the physical entity has traveled across virtual terrain and coming back to the world, right? But no longer in a physical uh, uh, nature, uh, but it's blended with uh, a beat. Uh, fourth in the list is being here and there in hybrid or a hybrid environment. This very much capture our lifestyles uh, at the moment, especially in the lockdown period, where we have to constantly switch between uh, online and offline. Yeah, and last, being here and there and everywhere, uh, which is a very post-humanist post-humanistic view of distributed mind. Following the post-human concept of consciousness, uh, consciousness is not restricted to brain. Yeah, Consciousness is a function of an organism. It's not even an organ. Yeah, Consciousness, body and environment are all continuous. And consciousness, um, technically speaking, can extend 
as technology enable uh, the extensions of our network boundary. In the following diagram, I would like you to regard this uh, figurative dot as a derived from yourself as a starting point of actual presence from where we can measure the spatial proximity of other types of presence mediated by different uh, network technology. So take for example, uh, sensor feedback systems uh, does indeed allows us to sense or collect information about ourselves and in an environment and integrated them into a more holistic perceptions of the world, forming a global consciousness or a planetary thinking network. According to Latour Actor Network Theory, material objects are accountable for our epistemological understanding of the world in relational network made up of humans and non-humans. So take the plant for instance, the plants will become an agency of us uh, sensing the world. Uh, recently, I've been developing in the practice and project related to mapping. Yeah, because I find uh, space is a very interesting way of organizing uh, human experience, as we have always been uh, fascinated by map in our wayfinding and self locating. Yeah. This newly emerged art form under the umbrella term locative art. Uh, sometimes it's called GPS drawing by practitioners. Some call it uh, psychogeography, some call it mapping art. Uh, basically concerned with the visual form resulted from the visualizations of our uh, geographical data, um, the longitude and also the latitude. Um, it's a practice that combines art traveling and technology and most often the manifestations of uh, locative art is in the form of a visual uh, and it's usually in a very large scale or uh, we call it the earth scale kind of artwork and i find this interesting because uh, geographical coordinates can um, can be conceptualized as our existential proof yeah and i start to think of locativeness as a vector in directing my thoughts, system and experiences. So for the past years, I have been uh, recording my uh, daily movement uh, with an application that is running at the background of my mobile devices. And over time, the daily rhythms of my life forming an emergent portrait of my life of myself yeah so these are just some of examples of the uh, gps drawing uh, this is a monthly drawing and this is a yearly drawing uh, this is just a different uh, method of uh, different experimentations some experimentations playing with the different visualization technique So for me, GPS can be considered as an instrument that extends our body to leave a visible mark on the surface. And it lived, it exists in the leaf space, right? Which is the physical space as we perform our uh, uh, moving about in the, in the physical space and also virtual as a means of uh, communicating visual ideas, yeah? So I would like you to contend GPS as a prosthesis that extends uh, my hand into the virtual terrain and creating a drawing that manifests visually in the virtual space and also cognitively in cyberspace as we have to imagine uh, how we moved right before we literally take the actions of moving. This very much uh, um, uh, correspond to the concept of uh, post-virtual in its operation. So this is a, a, a video. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have a, a video for this. 
Uh, basically, in these installations, I project my one-year GPS movement onto a Petri dish, uh, sort of give the audience a micro view of uh, my, my, my activity on Earth. Yeah, so this analogy is based on the observations on a schema uh, of observations on the individual at different level. At the micro level or the neural level, I focus on the mind where our consciousness arise from. At the meso level or the body level, I address the role of uh, our body in uh, while we are performing the actions of uh, moving in the environment. And lastly, at the macro level, uh, which is enabled by the GPS and also the satellite uh, that give us the spatial relational properties of large-scale complex environment. In this diagram, I try to uh, explain the framework of presence to illustrate the performative practice of locative media to ultimately reach what uh, contributes as a self-consciousness of presence. So basically, we see the operations while we are using locative media at three level, uh, the micro level, meso or the bodily level, and also the macro level. Yeah, uh, Put it in simple terms, it's basically embodied selfhood get carried into a cycle of iterations across different spaces. And it sort of form a, a iterative feedback loop. Uh, last, I would like to talk about the final piece of my work called the uh, epistemology of uh, Phoenix. Uh, in 2019, I was asked to take, uh, I was asked to participate in an exhibition uh, in Sejong Archive in Korea. I was asked by the commissioner to take uh, King Sejong music as a material. Yeah. So King Sejong is a very celebrated uh, king in the history of Korea. Um, he left behind uh, a, a lot of legacy of, uh, um, of culture uh, uh, and also other cultural history like language, uh, particularly in uh, music as well. Yeah, so the song that it's given to me is called Bong Nai. And it drew inspirations from the uh, mystical creature, uh, the Phoenix. It's a creature in ancient Eastern literature that has the power to reincarnate. In this piece, I use a uh, digital fabrications technique, uh, particularly laser cutting and 3D printing to recreate the phoenix, not as a representational image, but as a data visualization to explain how living experiences and memories that dies in the head can eventually rise from the ashes and take a new form now as a cultural artifact in a museum. So basically, I did a FFT analysis on the sound. So FFT analysis is basically an algorithm that dissect the uh, the audio uh, and visualize the different uh, frequency uh, uh, wavelength. Yeah, so this is uh, FFT um, uh, analysis in a visual form. And this um, and later on from here, we can create a lot of a uh, UV map for our three D objects. I'll just play you a video to show you the uh, FFT analysis. It will be played together with uh, the, the Korean music as well.
So the spike that you see basically uh, indicating there's a high frequency. So by slicing off this pattern uh, into uh, a laser cut wood piece, which eventually assemble all together uh, into this uh, sculpture that you see in the image. Yeah. So on the other side, uh, there's the 3D print of the sound as well. So this is a closer look of the installations. You can literally see the sound wave if you take a closer look. And inside the sculpture, you see um, uh, I purposely coded it with uh, reflective material. So with a bit of light, you'll be able to see a kaleidoscope effect of uh, uh, a light, you know, I sort of wanting to create a representation of the physical characteristic or the attributes of a phoenix. So they sort of resemble the skill or the feather of the phoenix. Yeah, so this is a 3D print of the, uh, the, the song itself. So there was a camera zooming into the details of this uh, 3D print sculpture, which I call it the memory scape. Yeah. So I want people to pay attention to the physical properties of uh, uh, of the of the memory. And the camera is panning from left to right uh, in a cycle, and just going back and forth endlessly. So this is what the audience will see on the uh, uh, on the projections. So in this piece, when I was searching for the cultural compatibility between Korean culture and my own culture, I was also reaffirming my own culture and that identity by knowing what I'm not. This fabrications experiment exemplify a post virtual conditions whereby objects can travel as beats and finally manifested in atom or physical state. This kind of suggests that memory in narrative uh, is disembodied. It doesn't have uh, any physical sort of storage, but physical manifestations of cultural memory is being embodied to form the identity of a person uh, for him or her to understand who he or she is, at least with the functions of a memory institutions. So in this case, uh, the Sejong archive in Korea. So last, I will finish off with uh, predictions that uh, we could possibly be looking at the engineering of existence in the future with the technology of presence, uh, virtual reality, uh, holographic display, uh, locative media, um, machine learning. Um, Deleuze and Guattari argue for a desiring machine with which we can express our desire and connect uh, with the world. This ideology resonates with our consciousness uh, and also desire to use tools to, to accentuate and also to know our existence and possibly looking for advice of uh, direction. It's not just about studying our habits and patterns of life, but also predicting our future movement. Yeah, this, uh, this, ideological is, this ideology is so powerful that it's propelling us out of our idleness and forces to move and we might not be able to fully aware and understand uh, in the future why we are heading to a certain direction. Uh, by that time, we could come to a dialectic of existence of freedom and choice and that will probably promise to relook into the concept of um, fate.
So this is something that is comparable to the ancient uh, Taoism practice, which is a type of uh, divine technology used in the ancient times to locate uh, groundwater and valuable germs. But perhaps in the future, uh, this technology will be used to look for other uh, values in the future. So, okay, we are coming to the end of my presentations. I would just like to thank you for listening. Uh, this is a link to my uh, my project, my website, and this is a special specific URL that will direct you to the projects. And uh, this is my uh, sort of a commercial lab that I've set up together with a few of my colleagues. It's called it's it's actually a fabrications uh, cafe. So we combine the concept of cafe with uh, a fabrications laboratory. So a lot of uh, the, 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 you know, the technical experimentations, especially in, in relates to fabrications, the digital fabrications is coming from uh, the effort of my uh, fabrications cafe. So if you like, if you have any questions, I would like to take them. I will, I will be happy to answer them now. If you like to talk further, or you would like to, uh, I'm open for any collaboration. So um, you can contact me at my personal email, uh, limkokyong at gmail.com, um, or my official working email, uh, kylim at mmu.edu.my. Thank you for your attention and thank you for your time. Thank you, Megan. Uh, uh, Megan is a colleague of mine in another campus. Uh, thank, you, thank you for spending your time with us this afternoon. I hope the subject matter is not too dry or too boring. <laughs>